I'd like to welcome everybody to this month's Tech Session podcast put on by PowerShell.org. Uh, this week, uh, this month, we have Tim Warner. He's an author and tech evangelist over at Pluralsight. Um, we're going to be covering understanding what you're typing in in the Windows PowerShell console. Take it away, Tim. Thanks very much, Nicholas. And thank you, attendees, for being here today. I look forward to answering any or all questions that you have. Go ahead and type them in the chat window, and Nicholas will triage those and feed those to me as we go along. Please pardon my voice. It's scratchy. I caught a whopper of an upper respiratory infection over the weekend. Those of you who are parents know about the kindergarten Petri dish. <laughs> but anyway, we're here to discuss and learn how we can get a better grasp of what we're typing in PowerShell. And that'll make more sense, I hope, as we go along. First, for your reference, this session is being recorded. I think Nicholas mentioned that. It'll be published on the PowerShell.org YouTube channel. Also, you're probably interested in the session materials, specifically this PowerPoint presentation and the PowerShell script that I wrote for us today. The addresses are these. Of course, you could just go to YouTube and look for PowerShell.org, but I created a bit.ly link for that. And my website is timwarnertech.com, and there's a zip file up there right now that you can grab called warner-techsession.zip. It's just a half of a megabyte, and it contains a PDF version of this slide deck as well as the PowerShell script file. I'm going to display this link at the end of the presentation as well. So if you don't get it now, don't fret about it. <clears throat> I want to level set briefly because just the title of the presentation probably doesn't give you an awful lot of information. I designed this session, and by the way, we'll go for 50 minutes. I'm super respectful of your time. Today's a work day after all. I would say that this is a 150 level session. If you're familiar with Microsoft's descriptives 100 200 300 400 i'd say we're right in the middle because it would be good if you've had some mileage on you so to speak with your powershell so that you have run into some of these problems but at the same time this is really officially a beginner level session so i'm not taking anything for granted regarding the knowledge that you're coming in with first the i originally called this section the problem but i decided to be a little politically correct and said challenge. You're going to see why in just a second. <laughs> you probably know who this guy is, Jeffrey Snover, the art lead architect of Windows Server and the father of PowerShell. If you go to the Windows PowerShell blog, he, he contributes every once in a while. And I just happened to find this little one-liner in one of his articles. And if you're like me, unless you've got a lot of miles on you with your PowerShell, you look at that and you think, what in the world is he trying to say with that code? My favorite programmer in the world is Bruce Payette, who also is an architect of the PowerShell language. In his book, PowerShell in Action, which admittedly is not a beginner's book, in the very first chapter, he has a one-liner that looks like this. And once again, if you're starting off on your learning curve in Windows PowerShell, you see this that would probably confirm your worst fears. Namely, my God, I thought that I didn't have to be a programmer to know PowerShell. I thought that PowerShell was a systems administrator friendly front end to the .NET framework. And that's true. And I point these guys in this code out in a tongue in cheek way. There's some, I mean, how can you criticize Jeffrey Snover and Bruce Payette? They've invented the language for heaven's sake. But along those lines, tell me how many of you can relate to this notion. You're searching the web to solve a particular problem. You find a blog that has some PowerShell one-liner or maybe a script, and you're desperate. You need to get a particular automation task finished. So you think, well, I have no idea what this code does, but here goes nothing. I'm going to cross my fingers. Copy, paste, go. And in the best case, it'll work. You may not be able to document or explain it very well, but in the worst case, I hope that this hasn't been any of your experience. But I've known people that have been there, done that, and bought this particular T-shirt. And it will definitely make you more gun-shy to approach Windows PowerShell in the future. So given that, the problem being you don't have a lot of time, you're spinning a lot of plates, how can you actually understand what you're typing to get a feel for the PowerShell language? 
I'm presenting a solution. I would never be so arrogant as to say the solution. And it's nothing magical. It's kind of anticlimactic. It's just a question of building our knowledge along a specific path that I'm going to share with you over the next however many minutes, 40 something minutes, and being able to and going ahead and applying the knowledge. Of course, we don't just want head knowledge. We want to actually practice, practice, practice. So it becomes muscle memory or something like that. So enough of the slides. Let's spend the rest of our time together in the Windows PowerShell integrated scripting environment. This is the script file that I have up on my website for you. And I'm just going to go through it. First of all, notice that I have a break statement up at the very top. This is a nice fail safe when, you're, when you know in advance you don't want to run an entire script end to end. Because, of course, if we did accidentally press F5 or click the Run Script button, it would stop right here on the first line. So I like to do that being a trainer with, with all my demos, just as a safety net. Again, this piece here I put to underscore the importance of documentation. Yes, it's possible to over-document, over I guess is the word I'm looking for. But at the very least, one of the big themes here is understanding that in all likelihood your PowerShell code is not going to exist in a vacuum. You may be sharing it directly with your colleagues, your teammates, your boss, your clients, your customers, or if you're community minded, you're sharing your work with the larger community. We don't want to put the people who are consuming our scripts into the position of having to guess what our methodologies are and try to just parse the language. So comments are certainly one way to help that. Another tip, the way I've organized this particular script is by using what are called regions. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those. Basically, a region is allow, allows you to expand or contract different parts of a single script file. This might be divided by function. Here I'm dividing just by the topics that we're going to be going over. And the syntax is um, octothorpe or pound sign region with no space, space, and then your friendly name. And then when you do a pound n region, the ISC fills in the rest. Now a tip that many people don't know is that control M is nice because it'll do a global collapse or expansion. That's nice if you've got a whole lot of stuff in the script file. Okay. Now the first section I have for us to look at is just making sure we understand the alias system. First of all, it comes as a surprise to some systems administrators that PowerShell.exe is different, a totally separate executable from cmd.exe. And although we can do stuff like dir all day long and it appears to act like the cmd.exe counterpart, that's not the case. For instance, if we do something like this, dir star.txt wide forward slash wide, if you remember that from MS-DOS, whoops. <laughs> the autocomplete is trying to correct me, isn't it? It's not going to work because really the PowerShell team created aliases that map all of our favorite MS-DOS and Linux and OS 10 terminal commands, maybe not all of them, but a good number of them, into commandlets, which of course is the unit of functionality, the elemental unit of functionality in the language. So simple get alias is going to just give you a big dump of all of those built-in mappings. Again, the whole point here is to make the shell more familiar to those of us who are new to it. That having been said, a community best practice is to avoid aliases in your scripts wherever possible. Why do you think that's a suggestion? If you were here in front of me, if we were in a classroom or something, I would ask you that question. Well, it's because you're creating ambiguity, isn't it? Remove item property aliases to RP. How would somebody running your script necessarily know that? It's going to slow them down unnecessarily. So a best Suggestion is to always expand your commandlet names and avoid aliases. Sure, if you're working on your own system and you're in a console and you're just ad hoc, um, you know, like DIR or LS or I mean, um, invoke web method, I, th I, I can't remember a lot of them, but you, you see the list right here. And I think you've get the point. Let's see, if you want to quickly resolve a specific alias, this is a good skill to know. If you see something unfamiliar, you can bring in the name parameter. So DIR, for instance, you just pass that in and it'll tell you any aliases that are built into the language for that. 
get alias also has a definition parameter that's just the opposite. If you're wondering, for instance, what aliases are built into PowerShell that map to the commandlet get child item. So you can be ambiguous here if you forget your parameters. That's actually another important principle of today's session is always spell out and use your parameter names, but we'll get to that in just a second. Of course, somewhat related is the topic that we can, if we want to, create our own custom aliases and store them in our PowerShell profile, but that's, that's not really in our scope today. So we're looking to gain intelligence. So if we see online somebody posted a script that we feel can help us, and we see that it's littered with some aliases, we can use some of these tools to quickly figure out what the heck's going on and potentially make the corrections to the code ourselves. You may be familiar with the PowerShell script analyzer. For a little while, this module was included in the Windows Management Framework, but I just upgraded mine WMF to the RTM version, and I, I swear it wasn't there. So I used the PowerShell get to do a find module to locate it in the PS gallery, and then I installed it here. Normally, I'll add a verbose when I install a package or a module just so you can see everything that PowerShell is doing. But the PowerShell script analyzer can spot some of those violations of community best practices. So if we run, for instance, a get command against the PS script analyzer module, we can see it's very simple. There's just two commandlets, invoke, which is what you use to run, and get script analyzer rule that shows you the built-in scripts. And I believe this is hosted on GitHub, so you can extend it to create your own rules and blah, blah, blah. That's beyond our scope. But I wanted to point this out. And for instance, let's change our location to my tech session folder in my Dropbox. And then I have a PS1 file that I called bad script. And notice that it's just, I mean, bad is a relative word, I guess. It's just very simple. It's using an alias called GCI. We're not using named parameters here, so we're making assumptions on how PowerShell is going to bind data to parameters. Looks like we're using a question mark instead of some other unknown commandlet. We're using um, wildcard, the asterisk wildcard with double quotes. And the common question is, what's the difference between single and double quotes in Windows PowerShell? We're using select and then this dash F5. At first blush, this may appear frustratingly um, or unnecessarily complex. Again, may be nice for a quick ad hoc console one-liner, but to include in your script that you're sharing with others, maybe not the best idea. So here I'm going to clear the host and then I'm going to jump into invoke script analyzer. If you don't know, the semicolon is a statement separator. It's different from the, the pipeline. It's just a way to run two totally separate commands, one after the other, instead of having to put them on separate lines. And I'm using the parameter path to path out to that bad script.ps1. And let's see what happens. It looks like we got three warnings from the script analyzer. And sure enough, all three of them have to do with commandlet aliases. Okay. So again, just, and it tells us specifically what's what. Again, that's good. It's intelligence. It's going to help us straighten out our code and make it really nice and friendly to, like I said, customers, colleagues, especially if you've been hired to write a script from somebody. I would submit that it's, it almost goes without saying, although here I am saying it, <laughs> that you would never deliver a script that isn't fully documented and fully spelled out. All right. So that's that. Um, at the end of the uh, presentation, I have a couple closing slides. And in one, I mention a community tool. Unfortunately, it's not free. But have any of you ever heard of ISE steroids? A community member named Dr. Tobias Weltner created it. It's an add-on to the ISE that has built-in logic to help you refactor your code. And, and it, it'll pick up a lot more than just commandlet aliases. It'll, it'll jar you or it'll flag stuff when you're using double quotes when they're really not necessary. By the way, in case you didn't know, the main difference, at least from my perspective, between the single quote and the double quote in Windows PowerShell is that you'll use double quotes when you want to do variable expansion. If you have a variable inside a quoted string 
and you want PowerShell to substitute the variable name with the variable value, that's your trigger to use double quotes. Other than that, I myself use single quotes as a standard. When I teach beginning PowerShell classes, I like to focus on at least what I call the holy trinity commandlets, which are get help, get command, and get member. Of course, PowerShell hasn't shipped with local help files for a long, long time, so you'll want to make sure that you're in the habit of updating help every once in a while. By default, it'll only make a call to Microsoft web servers once every 24 hours, but you can override that with force if you want to. And this piece right here simply bulldozes any error notifications that come up. It's up to you whether you want to do that. But get help, very important. I'm sure you're probably already using it now. When you're in the console, some of the favorite tips that I suggest in terms of building knowledge and practical application, understanding what we're doing, is to just run examples. And as long as you've updated your help file, you'll get those right in the console window. Something else that you may or may not be aware of is the show window switch. I'm a multi-monitor guy. I have three monitors here in my office. I can't imagine being productive with fewer than two monitors nowadays. But show window is beautiful, excuse my voice again, <clears throat> because it will put the entire help article in a separate window. And of course, we can put this in another monitor so we can keep our script or our console window up in a non-overlapping, non-intrusive way. It's very cool. And then, of course, especially if any of you looked at the documentation for DSC, Desired State Configuration, for Office 365, for Azure, you'll find that there are absolutely huge gaps. And I found that even keeping my local help files up to date, I still get nada. So you can force an online check and pop open your default browser. Again, that's gonna depend on the module it looks like. The term online is not recognized as the name. Jeez, this should be correct. Get help. I don't think you highlighted the whole line. Oh, thank you. Gosh, I would have thought that I could just put my cursor within the line. There we go. So it'll open my default web browser and give me a page. <clears throat> and normally, if they're documented at all, it'll show up online. And there's your um, examples and so on. But that's definitely a, an, a recognized issue by the PowerShell team. And I submit the Azure team that the documentation definitely needs quite a bit of work. But at PowerShell Summit, I'm convinced that they're definitely on it. Some people, again, they see references to help versus get help, understanding the difference. There's really just a minor difference. You know how you do order of operations, PEMDAS with parentheses being at the top of the so-called arithmetic food chain? Parentheses are really cool in PowerShell because of a similar thing. You can prioritize sections of your code or just work with it in a grouped fashion. So for instance, this get command name help wrap that in parens and then we can use the so-called dot notation to access some of the properties of this object and definition is going to give you an underlying source code view of that particular function because as it happens get help is an honest to goodless commandlet that was built i presume it was written in c sharp help is a function written in um, powershell and you'll notice if you come down to the very bottom, the meat, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, is down here on the last line. Help does nothing else but run the get help commandlet, binding, bringing along anything you added, like in this case, the name of the commandlet or function that you want help with. And it does the old pipe to more trick that is kind of fascinating that more is still as present now as it ever was. I remember it back in the early MS-DOS days it's how you could stop screen after screen of output from flying by. Let's see, what else do we want to understand as we're going along? Certainly this issue of parameters, I think, is really important. I mentioned about the avoiding aliases. I mentioned about spelling out your, your commands. Another thing deals with parameters, understanding what they are and how they work. If you want to know specifically which commandlets have a certain parameter, Again, that's pretty easy to do. I meant CLS, not CMD. For instance, if you know much about Windows PowerShell remote management, you've got the old DCOM RPC way that's really not the suggested way to do remote PowerShell. 
and then we have the newer WS man. Well, normally the computer name parameter is a big flag in the air that says, I'm using the old school remoting. We're probably going to have some firewall problems here and so forth. So this command here, get command with parameter name, will come back with all of the commandlets that include that particular parameter in their list. And if you're wondering, for instance, uh, what are all the parameters of a particular commandlet? You can do something like get help. Note that I'm giving the parameter name, even though I really technically don't need to. And of course, I'm stating it explicitly. A nice thing about the PowerShell ISE is that it will helpfully do tab completion. So you can type just a stub of a command and have it finish it. And it'll also drop down parameters. And even when parameters have a collection of predefined values, you can get those from the ISE as well. So I'll do tab completion. And if we do like a parameter star, if you don't know specifically the name of the parameter you're interested in, the asterisk, of course, is a wild card that means give me all of them. Why is it important for us to understand that? Well, we'll get to it. We're moving slowly along. What is it? 121 here in Nashville, Tennessee. When we're doing command discovery, I find it sometimes faster when I add some basic filters, instead of just doing get command Azure RM, I want to get the, the highest search relevance. I guess I'm accustomed to using those Google advanced search operators. So get command, I make use of verb and or noun a heck of a lot. And you can oftentimes get a lot of mileage with the asterisk either before and or after the keyword. I know that Azure RM is the, the noun prefix of the Azure Resource Manager commandlets, and I have those modules installed on my system right now. So if I just want to see all the gets that exist in that particular module set, I can just simply add that to my get command statement and go from there, you see. If I want to see all the commands from a particular module and I know the module name, I can just do a get command module you know, and then building on from there. Now, mention this parameter thing. There's some important stuff I want to talk to you about here. I already talked about the parameter parameter. <laughs> How about something like this? Get help, get a name, get event log, parameter log. Now, okay, that shows you a particular parameter. We've already been through all of this right here. Jeez, forgive me. How about the notion of positional parameters? Remember that a parameter is a way to customize how a commandlet or PowerShell function behaves. A switch parameter is essentially an on-off switch. It's dash something. And normally, if you include it, it's on. And if you don't include it, it's implied off. But you'll see sometimes on code that you download from blog posts that oftentimes the pipelines will just run without parameter names, like you see here, this is get child item. And I know in my head, I will do path, even though sometimes it feels silly. If I'm just sitting in my office all by myself and I'm running GCI, it's kind of silly to include it. But the reason I do is to just embed it in my mind, how important it is to be explicit. Yes, this will work, because that's I because I happen to know that the first positional parameter for get child item is path. But you may not know that. The people you share your code may not know that. You see? And there's another parameter, I think it's called filter, and we're just implying it here. I'm not even sure if this is going to work. Let's actually uh, select this line and run. Yeah, it, r it ran. I mean, let's face it. PowerShell can be pretty darn forgiving. You can be sloppy as all get out with your code. But look here, what if we start throwing the stuff around in different locations like GCI, star DLL, path? I mean, it makes sense to you when you write it, you know. But that one bombs out with red. So what am I getting at here? It's important to expect, inspect the help file so we can figure out exactly what's going on with those parameters. Let's do a get help, get event log because I had mentioned that earlier and I'll put it in a separate window and let's just quickly make sure we understand some stuff here in a help article. A fully populated help article is going to give you a short synopsis of what the command does. Then you'll see this syntax stuff which at first blush looks super complex. 
but you'll find one or more what are called parameter sets. They're groups of parameters that function together. You can't mix and match them. And the reason I chose get event log here, I did this intentionally because they're very clearly delineated, the use cases here. This first parameter set is when you wanna drill into one or more event logs on the local and or remote computers. You notice that we've got this first parameter called log name that expects string data. Um, let's see, and then we've got computer name, which could be the local computer or remote computers. This has strings with a little open and closed square brackets that signifies an array, which means that feasibly we could feed an entire list of computers into this commandlet. So anyway, like I said, these are all related parameters that match that use case. The second use case is more global. We can look at the event logs, not their contents, but for instance, if we do get event log list, it's just going to give you a list of the metadata. For instance, let me quickly show you that. Let me, hello, get my ISC back and adjust the split here. See, so get event log list is using that second parameter set. By contrast, I can do get event log, log name, system, newest, three entries, you see? So that's a good description of the differentiation there. Let's see, let's get our help window back. Did I close the dadgum thing? Nope, here it is. What else is important in understanding the help file? Frankly, this business here, inputs and outputs. Now, I've never seen, or I don't, you can't really use get event log in the middle of a pipeline. It says inputs none. You can't put any data into this commandlet, but other commands like select object and where object are built to be embedded within a pipeline. So it's important for you, for you to understand what data type is expected coming into a given commandlet. And just as importantly, what .NET data type is coming out of the commandlet. And that one is populated. It looks like we've got string data, which is pretty well logical when you think about what the event log system is in Windows. Unfortunately, it's not going through the parameters. Like I said, this is one of those weird idiosyncrasies where even though I know I've updated my local help files, it's still not showing me everything. It's crazy. You'll notice that the official, quote unquote, official way to do a commandlet is with title case where the noun and the verb are capitalized. And the tab completion can help you with that. For instance, I just did get dash h tab and it fixed. And again, the principle of that is not to be nitpicky and not to be all geeked out on the details, but in my opinion, it's to improve the legibility of your code. And frankly, tell me if you agree. When I see a script that's all this lower or inconsistent case, it speaks to perhaps a little bit of a lack of attention to detail. And if I were a paying customer, that would be maybe not a red flag for me, but a yellow one at the very least. So get event L and let's do um, online. Okay, yeah, so this one's given us the parameters. It's important for you to, to be able to quickly parse the parameter data. In fact, I'm just going to change this up really quick. Instead of get event log, let's look at get child item. And we'll look at its parameters. I mentioned that path parameter and that I happen to know it's first. Let's come down and verify that. So the path parameter of get child item, it tells us that it uses a string data type. Again, no surprise there because this would be a local or remote path, wouldn't it? But this attribute table is cool because it tells you at a glance if the parameter has a predefined alias, generally we're not too concerned with those, right? <laughs> Whether it's required, true or false. Now you might think, well, what in the heck is get child item gonna do if you don't include any path? if you just do get child item filter star.txt or star.log. Well, that comes right here, look, default value. It happens that get child item has a default value of the current directory. So if you don't specify anything, it's gonna just give you a directory listing of wherever your command prompt is at the moment. 
position, super important here. Number one, it's a positional parameter. So that means if you do a get child item dash path, that's fine. If you do a get child item C windows, that's still okay because the PowerShell parser will assume that that first string bit, your path in this case, is to be bound to the path parameter. Now that having been said, it's important to note that you can do stuff like this. Let me go back to C. Get child item filter star dot text path. I'll just say the current working directory, which could be signified as a dot. You see what I mean? By using named parameters, you don't have to stress about positional parameters, making sure that your position one is in the one spot and two is in the two spot. Because as long as we're explicit, it doesn't matter what order we put them in because PowerShell knows. It can take comfort, so to speak, <laughs> if, 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 if the PowerShell runtime can feel emotions, that is. That's another discussion for another time, I guess. <laughs> but hopefully you get what I'm, you're um, picking up what I'm throwing down, so to speak. All right, let's see. Okay, I think that's it for now. So let's come back to the ISC. Nicholas, any questions coming up? Uh, no, actually, um, uh, I just want to remind people, if you guys want to ask questions about any topics that he's covering, um, type them in and I will voice them. But um, no, no, no questions yet. Okay, now that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Being a trainer, I need more context to know. <laughs> yeah, if we could see that faces, that'd be much I know. better. I know, it makes a big difference. Whoops. All right, what do we have left here? Pipeline, PS drives, and various tips. Let me jump down to various tips here, just because I want to be absolutely sure I get this in. I'm going to give you a link when I close up the presentation to a PowerShell.org resource. It's called the Community PowerShell Practices or something. That's not the exact name. But it's a really nice summary of some of the stuff that we're talking about today. And a couple examples I took directly from that document are one, avoiding back ticks in your code, and two, being careful with write host and third, output streams. Let's quickly take this one step at a time. A common newbie mistake is you're doing a complex pipeline or just simply you want to make your code easier to read so you want to put parameters on separate lines. I mean some commandlets have a honking long list of parameters as we've seen. So you might have learned first of all the hard way is you just do a enter or a soft enter and you find that that bombs out. And then you hear somebody tell you well the back tick is a line continuation character in PowerShell. So you can make your code as pretty as a picture. Just make sure that you put a back tick at the end of each line. And technically that is true. However, I'm going to select this get WMI object statement and it bombs right out. Again, if we were in person, I would ask you, why does it bomb out? I've got a back tick on both lines that I'm continuing. I shouldn't need a back tick on line 137 because that's the end of the statement. Well, the answer to that question is, and you wouldn't know this really unless you knew about it, when you use a back tick, you can't have any other spaces after it on that line. It has to be literally back tick enter. And sure, if you're careful with that, you can line up your parameters and it'll look, like I said, pretty as a picture. Now, there are tools that can make that a little bit easier to spot, like that ISE steroids tool. Uh, that has an option that'll show non-printing characters so you can actually see little dot dot and that makes it super easy to fix the errors in that case. But the general community practices to generally avoid these because they're so prone to problems. You have to know exactly how they work and the little space gotcha otherwise you're going to get some weird results and some code bombing out. Now another thing we could do for a, um, a pipeline would be to break at the pipe. Like if we were doing um, get event log, log name application, select object property. Gosh, I don't even remember any of the property names. I'll just do that. <laughs> 
And if we wanted, if this was a super long pipeline that rolled off the screen and we wanted to share the code with our team and we wanted to see everything in one screen, we could break at the pipe. Again, no space after the pipe and that'll work fine. That, that works good as well. But you just wanna be really careful what you're doing. According to that um, PowerShell org resource, what they suggest is to do something called splatting. Potentially you could use another technique called here strings. But if you've ever heard of splatting, splatting is where you can roll up a bunch of parameter value pairs. You create what's called a hash table, and the syntax for that is at, and then open and close curly braces. And then as you can see, we have these key value pairs, class equals, in this case, win32 logical disk, semicolon, then you can just build your hash table separated by semicolons store that in a variable, params is as good as any, and the splatting occurs when you pass that entire hash table array into the commandlet, and get WMI object will just translate all of these into the appropriate parameter names, class, filter, and computer name, okay? So certainly that would make the code potentially easier to understand. Another common, almost a joke, is this backlash against using write host. The use case here is your script is going to display output to the script runner. And the general practice is to avoid write host. Why is that is the big question. Well, number one, and I, I can prove this right here, it basically dead ends your pipeline. See, I'm creating a variable called wh where I do a write host, hi there, and Admittedly, write host allows you to do some cool formatting stuff, like you can do background color and foreground color. But if I run wh into get member, the third of those holy trinity commandlets, you see it bombs out. You must specify an object. So you may have output that you want to actually do something with. So again, I think I'm quoting that best practices book correctly, but you only want to use write host when you're intentionally displaying pure output on the screen. Like if you have a show commandlet that's just its whole reason for being, the function or commandlet's whole reason, reason for being is to display nicely formatted output, that's a, an appropriate logical use case for write host. Otherwise, the suggestions that are on PowerShell.org are to use write output, for instance. So what we're doing on line 155 is doing a write output. The position one parameter is called input object. And so let me run this line to populate that variable. And then if we go into get member, you see that we can do a heck of a lot with it because it's an actual honest to goodness object. Now I mentioned that in beginners classes, I like to focus on get command, get help, which we've looked at, and also get member. If you already know all this, please forgive the repetition, but get member is crucial because it outlines one of the most important things about Windows PowerShell, that all data is not raw text like it is in Linux or OS 10 terminals, but it's actually, it's object data. I, I almost envision PowerShell objects as like three-dimensional objects because these data structures have an associated data type. In your get member output, you can see the object type right at the top. It's string, system string. No big surprise there. And then we have a list of the members of that particular string object. And string has a lot of methods. Methods, if you don't know, represent essentially functions that are attached to that object class. So for text, you would imagine you could convert it to uppercase or lowercase. You can do all those things right here. That's one of the useful ideas behind get member. You can see what is available. Properties represent either read-only or read-write attributes of the object. That can be great for getting status. So for instance, we could do something like this. We can create a variable called spool that does a get service for our spooler service. And then using dot notation, we can just say,